Section 23 of the Central Period of the Middle Age, 918 to 1273, by Beatrice A. Lees. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 15 Frederick II and the Strife with the Papacy, 1216 to 1250. The story of the life and death of the Emperor Frederick II, 1197 to 1250, has all the dramatic interest of a great tragedy. The child of Apulia, the son of a Sicilian Norman mother and a German father, educated in the half oriental atmosphere of southern Italy, transplanted while still a youth to the ruder, harsher north, a genius checked and thwarted by untoward circumstances he embodied in his restless versatile complex nature the very spirit of the thirteenth century keen passionate eager subtle and sceptical the fifty-six years of frederick's life may be divided into four periods each connected with the figure friendly or hostile of a powerful pope in his orphaned childhood and early youth he was the ward and favourite of innocent the third from 1216 to 1227, he appears as the wily politician, skillfully managing Honorius III. From 1227 to 1241, he is the warrior, entering the lists against the redoubtable Gregory IX. And the close of the half-century saw him worsted in the final struggle with the still more formidable Innocent IV. The childhood of Frederick II, King of Sicily, at three years old was passed amidst stormy scenes contemporary chroniclers give us glimpses of him as a boy carried off by mark wald of ancona and striking his captors in impotent rage or curbing his spirited horse and brandishing his sword in mimic warfare or reading history in the long evenings of medium height but strong and well knit he inherited the fair complexion and reddish hair of his hohenstaufen grandfather barbarossa his naturally quick intelligence was carefully trained and developed under both european and saracen masters and the cosmopolitan court of palermo the trilingual town latin greek and arab was in itself a school of politics and diplomacy of science and philosophy languages and art married at the age of sixteen to constance sister of the king of aragon Frederick was crowned King of Germany two years later, in 1212, but it was not till the death of Innocent III in 1216 that he began to rule in fact as well as in name, and was able to gather up into his capable hands the threads of many conflicting interests, Sicilian, Roman, Lombard, and Eastern, and to weave them into a strong systematic policy. Innocent's successor on the papal throne was Honorius III of the Roman house of Savelli, who had been Frederick's tutor. His heart was set on carrying out Innocent's crusading project. Though the Fourth Crusade had been diverted from its object, soldiers of the cross were fighting, in the early years of the thirteenth century, against the heretics of southern France, the Moors of Spain, and the heathen Prussians of the north in twelve twelve and twelve thirteen the strange phenomenon of the crusade of children recalled the extravagant fervour of the days of peter the hermit thousands of hapless children and peasants embarked for the holy land at marseilles under the guidance of a shepherd boy of vendome or followed a young german visionary across the alps into italy hoping to reach palestine by way of brindisi many were lost at sea Many were sold into slavery in Africa, while others perished of hunger and exhaustion. But their enthusiasm proved that the crusading spirit was not dead, and in 1215, after the coronation at Aachen, Frederick II took the cross to show his gratitude to God. When in 1218 the death of Otto of Brunswick freed him from his once dangerous rival, the pope urged him to fulfil his vow and to join the expedition which in accordance with the decree of the lateran council had left europe in the preceding year the king of jerusalem at this time was john brother of walter of brienne and husband of the daughter of queen isabella and conrad of montferrat 
with the help of a contingent of dutch scandinavian and german crusaders he was now besieging damietta and frederick's arrival in egypt was eagerly expected sicily and the empire however were more to the son of henry the sixth than the needs of the holy land or even his plighted word he had promised innocent the third to renounce the title of king of sicily to confer the kingdom on his young son henry to be held as a fief of the papacy and to keep the sicilian kingdom and the empire apart yet in twelve twenty he induced the german princes by lavish grants of privileges to elect henry king of the romans and in the same year he crossed the brenner into italy was crowned emperor at rome and persuaded the pope to allow him to hold sicily for his lifetime on condition that the personal union of the two crowns should not become a real administrative union of the german and sicilian kingdoms in return frederick made extensive concessions to the papacy the clergy were exempted from taxation and lay jurisdiction all municipal statutes and customs which were opposed to ecclesiastical liberty were annulled and the secular power was placed at the disposal of the church for the extirpation of heresy in addition the emperor renewed his crusading vow meanwhile the crusaders in egypt had won damietta only to lose it again frederick instead of hastening to the rescue occupied himself in subduing a revolt of the saracens in sicily and won the pope's unwilling consent to the postponement of the fulfilment of his pledge finally the emperor took an oath to start in twelve twenty seven on pain of excommunication married as his second wife yolande or isabella daughter and heiress of john de brienne and in her right assumed the title of king of jerusalem the preparations for the long delayed crusade were approaching completion when in march twelve twenty seven honorius the third died and was succeeded as pope by a kinsman of innocent the third the aged but fiery and resolute gregory the ninth twelve twenty seven to twelve forty one in august twelve twenty seven frederick the second set sail from brindisi for the holy land three days later on the pretext of illness he returned to italy and was forthwith excommunicated by the pope nothing daunted he started again in june twelve twenty eight and reached acre in september the military orders held aloof from the excommunicated crusader the friars preached against him and many of his followers deserted him public opinion was still further outraged by the means he took to gain his ends he entered into negotiations with the sultan of egypt and induced him to grant a ten years truce and to cede bethlehem nazareth and jerusalem to the christians with the exception of the mosque of omar on the site of the temple on march eighteenth twelve twenty nine frederick marched into the holy city as king and on the following day since the patriarch of jerusalem would not crown him he lifted the royal crown from the altar of the church of the holy sepulchre and placed it on his own head without prelate priest or clerk he then took ship for italy and arrived at brindisi early in june even before his departure for palestine the renewal of the quarrel between empire and papacy had led to the issue of manifestos on both sides while the imperial partisans had stirred up so fierce a tumult in rome that gregory the ninth had been forced to fly from the city while the emperor was in the holy land the pope was preaching a crusade against him at home the papal troops with the keys of saint peter on their banner led by john de brienne the ex-king of jerusalem and by two cardinals invaded southern italy and the mendicant friars exhorted the people to maintain the cause of the church but when frederick returned he quickly recovered all that he had lost and in twelve thirty the pope accepted the peace of san germano and released the emperor from excommunication the next five years were the most tranquil time in frederick's troubled life when an interval of comparative peace allowed him to regulate the internal affairs of his empire and to prove himself a statesman of no mean capacity 
in sicily he ruled as a beneficent despot and established a strong centralized absolute government three things he said himself ought to go hand in hand learning law and arms and these three he gave to his italian subjects he provided himself with a valuable force of mercenary soldiers by transporting large numbers of rebellious sicilian saracens to the mainland and establishing them as a military colony at lucera in apulia he founded the university of naples and patronized the school of medicine at salerno learned men jews arabs or europeans crowded his court among them the famous astrologer and translator of aristotle michael scott he was himself a poet and wrote verse in the vulgar tongue so that dante could see the source of italian poetry in the sicilian court if in this he resembles the royal troubadour richard coeur de lion in his administrative ability and activity he recalls richard's greater father henry of anjou or his own grandfather roger of sicily like them he was an organizer and a unifier bringing different laws and customs greek roman or lombard into harmonious order in twelve thirty one he issued a celebrated series of ordinances from melfi the constitutions of the kingdom of sicily for the better government of his dominions nobles ecclesiastics and cities were subjected to the high courts of justice and finance and the grand justiciar made an annual visitation of the kingdom to supervise the local officials justices financial chamberlains camerarii and bailiffs representative general assemblies foreshadowed a parliamentary system the towns were placed under royal control and everywhere the king's hand was heavy on the feudal nobles royal grants of land were resumed royal castles overawed the country while feudal dues were strictly exacted feudal privileges were curtailed ecclesiastical jurisdiction was regulated and constant aids and subsidies filled the king's coffers very different was frederick's policy in germany where he bribed the princes with concessions and privileges to support the ghibelline house and encouraged the tendency to feudal disruption and the rule of the aristocracy the year twelve thirty one which saw the issue of the sicilian ordinances saw also the promulgation at worms of the statute in favour of the princes statutem in favorum principum which gave almost complete judicial and military independence to the territorial magnates lay and ecclesiastical and restricted in their favour the liberties of the imperial cities in twelve thirty two also a severe edict was directed against the german communes and confraternities the long absences of the emperor gave further opportunity to the nobles to extend their power the young king henry the seventh was formally crowned in twelve twenty two and the government of germany was carried on in his name but after the assassination in twelve twenty five of his wise counsellor engelbert archbishop of cologne the pillar of the church and the shield of the state the country fell into utter anarchy aggravated by the terrible persecutions of heretics which frederick had sanctioned to win the approval of the clergy henry the seventh weakly ambitious and impatient of his father's authority tried to organize an opposition party by allying with the towns and the smaller nobility against the princes in twelve thirty two the disagreement between father and son ended in an actual revolt but henry was easily subdued and condemned to perpetual seclusion in apulia where ten years later he died his place as nominal ruler of germany was taken by his young brother conrad son of yolande of brienne frederick the second reached the climax of his power in twelve thirty five when after his marriage with his third wife isabella sister of henry the third of england he held a great assembly at mainz where peace was sworn ancient laws were established and new laws were decreed an attempt was made to give germany a centralized judicial organization on the sicilian model 
but the confirmation of the sovereign rights and privileges of the princes prevented any effectual administrative consolidation the real development of germany in the thirteenth century was social and economic rather than political provincial rather than imperial the quarrel with the welfs was healed and the heir of henry the lion was established in the new duchy of brunswick the king of denmark was forced to cede the lands he had conquered in the north and a way was opened for further expansion toward the east the marquises of brandenburg won and colonized pomerania the military order of the knights of the sword conquered livonia and Kurland. the great teutonic order with which the knights of the sword were subsequently united abandoned the defence of the holy land the work for which it had been founded in the twelfth century to support the poles in the subjugation of heathen prussia and hermann of salza the grand master of the order the loyal friend of frederick the second received from the emperor a confirmation and extension of the grants of prussian territory already made by the polish duke to the teutonic knights meantime in spite of opposition the german cities grew in wealth and independence the old german laws and customs were written down in the collections called the sachsenspiegel and the schwabenspiegel and the writings of lyrists like walter van der vogelweide and romantic poets like wolfram van eschenbach gave literary distinction to the german language while great princes like hermann landgrave of thuringia the husband of the holy saint elizabeth and frederick duke of austria posed as the patrons of men of letters and surrounded themselves with minnesinger and courtly satirists if in sicily frederick the second ruled as an absolute monarch and in germany as the feudal chief of a federation of princes in both kingdoms by coercion or conciliation he had made himself master defeat and tragic downfall were to come to him from his north italian dominions from the lombard cities and the ever hostile papacy as early as twelve twenty six the cities of northern italy uneasy at frederick's growing power in the south had renewed the lombard league and had been put to the ban of the empire in twelve thirty four they had supported henry the seventh in his revolt and had recognized him as king of italy in twelve thirty five henry again solemnly renewed the league the society of lombardy the march and romagna societas lombardia marcia et romani while the emperor declared war upon them in the assembly at mainz in twelve thirty six he crossed the alps into italy to avenge the wrongs of his father and grandfather and to root out the hateful plant of liberty in the war which followed milan was the leader of a strong anti-imperial party while frederick was supported by pavia parma cremona and a few other cities and by the powerful Etzelino da romano the lord of verona the city which commanded the road from germany to italy over the brenner pass in twelve thirty six the imperialists sacked vicenza and in twelve thirty seven they won a great victory at corte nuova between brescia and milan the milanese carroccio was taken and dragged in triumph by an elephant through the streets of cremona with the podesta of milan bound to the standard pole it was significant that frederick whose soldiers had gone into battle crying rome and the emperor miles roma miles imperator afterwards sent the carroccio as a gift to the romans the league would now have made peace had not the emperor demanded such stringent conditions that the milanese chose rather to perish sword in hand than to submit brescia made a heroic resistance and in twelve thirty nine the pope openly declared for the cities and excommunicated frederick in letters and manifestos both parties appealed to public opinion and once more the kingdoms of europe took sides in the duel of empire and papacy frederick wrote to the princes of christendom describing the pope as a proud priest and false prophet and reminding them that in an attack on one of their number the honour of all was concerned gregory compared the emperor to the beast that rose up out of the sea in the book of revelations and accused him of blasphemy and heresy for two years the war raged with extraordinary bitterness 
Frederick stirred up strife in Rome and the Papal States, while Gregory tried to rouse discontent in Germany. Venice and Genoa lent their aid to the papacy, but on the whole fortune favoured the emperor, and in 1240 only the unusual loyalty of the Romans to the Pope prevented the imperialists from entering the Eternal City. When in 1241 Gregory summoned a general council to meet at Rome, the imperial fleet captured the Genoese ships in which the foreign prelates had embarked and took prisoner so many of the ecclesiastical dignitaries that the council had to be postponed. The Milanese were defeated by the citizens of Pavia, and encouraged by these successes, the emperor again advanced on Rome and was within sight of the city when he heard of the death of the pope. Gregory the Ninth had nearly reached his hundredth year when, indomitable to the last, he succumbed to age and infirmities with the enemy at his gates. An intrepid politician, a zealot and persecutor, a great canon lawyer, with a profound belief in the papal supremacy, his struggles with the rebellious Romans, who more than once drove him from the city, and the long war with the emperor, could not shake his courage or bend his iron will. He is dead, wrote Frederick II, who deprived the earth of peace, and by whom discord flourished. Celestine IV, the pope elected in Gregory's place, died before he could be consecrated, and for a year and a half the papal throne was vacant. Then it was filled by a friend of Frederick II, Sinibaldo Fieschi, destined to become famous under the name of Innocent IV. Frederick's exclamation on hearing of the election, I have lost a friend, no pope can be Ghibelline, was probably put into his mouth by later historians, yet it expresses the truth. After some feeble attempts at making peace, Innocent IV fled to Genoa and retired thence to Lyon where in 1245 he held a general council, in which sentence of excommunication and deposition was pronounced on the emperor for breaking peace with the church, for sacrilege in taking prelates prisoner on their way to a council, for heresy and for perjury. Day of wrath and day of mourning, dies ista, dies irae, cried the imperial advocate Thaddeus of Suessa, as the Pope and the assembled prelates reversed and extinguished the lighted candles they held and declared Frederick excommunicate. What audacity, said the emperor when the news was brought to him, and placing his crown on his head, he added, I have not yet lost my crown, nor will I lose it without a bloody struggle. Once more Pope and emperor appealed to Europe. Frederick denied the papal right of imperial deposition, Innocent insisted on the elective character of the empire, and on the pope's power to bestow the temporal sword on the emperor, which carried with it the power of deprivation. The attempt of St. Louis to act as mediator proved a failure, and the last fight began. In Germany, the young King Conrad IV, aided by the Archbishop of Mainz, had held his own in spite of papal intrigues, and the terrible raids of the Tartars upon the eastern frontier. In Italy, Frederick's illegitimate son Enzo had been married to a great Sardinian heiress and was governing Italy as his father's vice-regent, with the title of King of Sardinia. The papalists now elected an anti-king in Germany, Henry Raspa, Landgrave of Thuringia, and on his death in 1247 they replaced him by William of Holland, a regular crusade was preached against the emperor, and the mendicant friars actively supported the pope. In Italy, a conspiracy gave the papalists the Ghibelline city of Parma, the key of the road to Rome, and when Frederick blockaded it, the besieged, by a daring sally, set fire to the town of Vittoria, which he had built outside the walls, seized his treasure, and forced him to retreat. This repulse was the turning point of Frederick's fortunes, the first of a succession of reverses. His trusted counsellor, Peter de la Vigne, who held the two keys of the emperor's heart, was accused of treason, disgraced, and blinded, and in despair committed suicide. His favorite son, the young and gallant Enzo, was taken prisoner by the Bolognese and condemned to lifelong captivity. But the imperialists, continued to hold out bravely in northern and central Italy, and Frederick himself, 
in his southern kingdom gathered his saracen troops about him and was preparing for a final attack on the states of the church and lombardy when death cut short his hopes and plans he died on december thirteenth twelve fifty at his castle of fiorentino near lucera guarded by saracens and tended by his illegitimate son manfred and by the archbishop of palermo thus he whom men could not overcome was conquered by the divine power at this time wrote the english chronicler matthew paris died the greatest of the princes of the world frederick the wonder of the world stuporamundi the marvellous revolutionist e mutator absolved from the sentence which bound him in the habit it is said of the cistercians and full of contrition and humiliation the papal historian on the contrary describes him as dying excommunicated and deposed gnashing his teeth and foaming at the mouth with loud crying and groaning he was buried in a splendid tomb by the side of his parents in the cathedral of palermo the capital of his beloved sicily the phrase stupor mundi the wonder of the world well expresses the feeling of the contemporaries of frederick the second toward the great emperor otto the third had been a world wonder too mirabilia mundi a marvel of precocious talent but the genius of frederick the second inspired terror and awe men stood amazed and stupefied before him and regarded him as something portentous and almost superhuman to the papalists he was an atheist a monster of iniquity antichrist himself he was accused of denying the immortality of the soul and the resurrection of the body of rejecting the mystery of the incarnation and of believing only what could be proved by physical science and natural reason he was said to have declared that the world had been deceived by three impostors moses jesus and mohammed in later days dante in the divinia commedia placed him in hell among the misbelievers yet even his enemies admitted his extraordinary ability the franciscan fra salimbeni wrote that if he had been a true catholic and had loved god and the church few emperors would have been his equals his followers seem to have looked on him as a kind of messiah a mystic incarnation of divine power they compared him to christ and punned on the name of his minister peter de la vigne the cornerstone the fruitful vine the peter who would not betray his master he himself spoke of his mother as holy and called his birthplace bethlehem and he was hailed as sanctus Fredericus. how far these claims were serious how far they represented mere extravagant adulation is doubtful frederick posed deliberately as the successor of the ancient roman emperors the heir of all their rights and dignities but he always professed his loyalty to the church which had excommunicated him though he advocated ecclesiastical reforms and in particular a return to apostolic poverty the primitive church he said was based on poverty and simplicity if his tolerance of jews and mohammedans his rationalism and love of scientific study were enough to condemn him in the eyes of the orthodox the visionary poetic strain in his character and his daring intellectual originality fascinated the imagination of the dreamer and the fanatic men were loath to believe that he was really dead the prophecies of the abbot joachim were applied to him and it was believed that he would come again whether for evil or for good as antichrist or as the defender of the church and the saviour of germany he was more than once personated by impostors and in the fifteenth century legend told how he waited hidden in a thuringian mountain for that day of the deliverance of germany modern historians differ in their judgments of frederick the second almost as much as the men of his own time to some he seems a sort of protestant reformer like henry the eighth of england subordinating the church to the state others see in him a precursor of the sceptical cultivated autocratic princes of the renaissance others again an oriental despot a kind of caliph or pope emperor supreme over both church and state but on one point all are agreed he whose heart beat only to be lord and sovereign of the whole world was the last of the great medieval emperors and with him 
closed the most heroic and most characteristic period of the Middle Ages. End of section 23. Section 24 of the Central Period of the Middle Age, 918 to 1273 by Beatrice A. Lees. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 16. The Coming of the Friars and the Medieval Universities, Part 1. The religious revival of the 11th century resulted in the triumph of Cluniac reforms and Hildebrandine political theories. The religious revival of the 12th century resulted in the foundation of the Cistercian Order. Its leading spirit was St. Bernard, the guide and counselor of the papacy, himself more powerful than any pope. As the renown of Cluny paled before that of Cito, so in the 13th century a new religious revival embodied a new conception of monasticism in the two great orders of mendicant friars, the Franciscans and the Dominicans. The older monastic orders had met the most pressing social needs of their time. They had softened the rudeness of secular life and had reclaimed and cultivated the waste places of the earth. But they had failed to advance with the times. It was reserved for the friars to appreciate and direct the new tendencies of the 13th century when Western society was threatened by subtle and peculiar dangers. The first throes of the dissolution of the old order had been felt. The stable aristocratic feudal system was becoming too narrow a frame for the rapidly developing popular spirit. Land and landholders lost their exclusive importance as commerce grew and towns gained weight and influence. There was a spirit of political discontent abroad, and with it, went a spirit of religious and intellectual unrest. The Crusades had done much both to extend the commercial sphere and to widen the mental horizon. Contact with Oriental modes of thought stimulated intellectual curiosity in the West, fostered imagination, and led to the formation of broader and more sympathetic views of life and humanity. These new ideals, this spiritual stir and ferment in Western Christendom, found expression in heresies such as that of the Albigenses, or in the assertions of municipal liberty which threatened the supremacy of feudal aristocracy, or again in the daring philosophical speculations which were current in the universities. The early monks had been charitable, orthodox, and dogmatic, reformers, though conservative reformers. The new religious teachers, if they were to succeed, would have to be something of popular revolutionaries. To add to charity enthusiasm, to orthodoxy and dogmatism, fervor, devotion, eloquence, and controversial zeal. It was the great merit of the friars that they recognized the needs of their age. St. Dominic, a Spaniard, founded a preaching order which should meet heretics and the enemies of Catholicism on their own ground and give believers a reason for their faith. St. Francis, an Italian, sought to humanize the Church and to restore Christianity to its primitive simplicity and unity by the pure force of love. The Dominicans persuaded the reason, the Franciscans touched the heart. St. Dominic was the hammer of the heretics, St. Francis was the father of the poor. Dominic Guzman of Osma in Castile, a canon regular, first made his mark as a missionary to the Albigensian heretics of southern France. Zeal, he taught, must be met by zeal, preaching falsehood by preaching truth. In 1215, Innocent III approved his plan of founding a preaching order. In 1216, Honorius III confirmed the orders of friars' preachers, fratres precatores, or black friars. The Dominicans at first adopted a modification of the rule of the Austin canons, but they afterwards borrowed the doctrine of mendicant poverty from the Franciscans. Like the Franciscans, too, they had an order for women and a third order for lay brethren. When St. Dominic died in 1221, more than sixty houses of friars' preachers had been established in Europe. 
while St. Dominic was laboring among the heretics of southern France, St. Francis was beginning his work of love in Italy. Francis, son of Peter Bernardone, a wealthy merchant, was born in 1182 in the little Umbrian town of Assisi. Inspired by an irresistible passion of spiritual devotion and pity for humanity, he renounced his family and friends, stripped himself of all worldly possessions, and went forth as a barefooted beggar to minister to the poor. He chose Lady Poverty for his bride, and his first simple rule began with the words, If thou wouldst be perfect, go sell all that thou hast and give it to the poor. His sweet temper, his merry humor, his intensity of conviction, and his sensitive poetic nature gave him extraordinary power over his contemporaries, and he soon found followers. The order of the friars minor, minorites, grey friars, Franciscans, or poor men of Assisi, was sanctioned by the Pope in 1210, received a more elaborate rule in 1221, and was fully organized in 1223. The order of the poor clares for women was the outcome of the conversion of St. Clara of Assisi, the friend and disciple of St. Francis, and the third order was founded for laymen who wished to follow the Franciscan teaching without entirely separating themselves from the world. St. Francis himself lived in a happy communion with God and nature, a rapture of love which lifted him above hardship and suffering men and women animals and birds trees and flowers were alike his friends he preached a sermon to birds and begged his little sister the mountain stream not to disturb his prayers by her babbling he wrote a hymn in italian to praise god for his brothers the sun the wind and the fire and his sisters the moon the water and the earth and when he was told that he had but a short time to live he exclaimed welcome sister death to him the highest grace was self-conquest and the will to suffer for the love of Christ, and he spent himself in tending the poor and the sick, or in such ecstatic meditation on the passion of Christ that he apparently produced in his own body the marks of the crucifixion, the stigmata in hands and feet and side. He died in 1226 in his little cell at the foot of the hill on which Assisi is built. He was canonized in 1228, and Pope Gregory the Ninth laid the foundation stone of the splendid church of San Francesco, which rose over his remains, a strange resting place for the poverello, the little poor one of Assisi. A beautiful bas-relief in Florence commemorates the meeting of St. Francis and St. Dominic, and Dante places them together in heaven, for their deeds were to one end. The two great founders of the mendicant orders were, in truth, both working for the purification of the church and the reform of society. Dominicans and Franciscans were alike grouped in congregations under local heads or provincials, with a superior general over all, but within these limits they enjoyed a great freedom. Unlike the cloistered monks, they were itinerant, wandering from place to place and preaching as they went. They were mendicants, too, vowed to absolute poverty, begging their bread from door to door and wearing the dress of the poorest of the people. In the flexibility of their organization and in the popularity of their attitude lay their strength. Unfettered by class privileges or ties of property, they brought the ideal of humility, poverty, and self-sacrifice into the daily life of court and castle, lonely farm and outlying hamlet, crowded street and busy workshop. Their mission was specially to the towns, the new centres of intellectual and social activity, but whereas the Black Friars appealed chiefly to the educated classes, the Grey Friars ministered to the inhabitants of the slums. The Dominicans were from the first the representatives of reason and science within the church, the watchdogs of the Lord, Dominicanes, the protectors of the true flock against heretic wolves. They won a commanding theological position in the University of Paris and gave to the world one of the most influential of medieval thinkers, St. Thomas Aquinas, while, as the directors, officials, and promoters of the Inquisition, they waged unremitting war against skepticism and incredulity. The Franciscans were primarily social reformers, renouncing human learning with all other worldly cares. 
yet they too were soon drawn into the current of intellectual life they became celebrated as teachers and obtained on the university of oxford almost as great a hold as the dominicans on the university of paris constant observation of the diseases of the poor led them to the study of medicine and physical science and in later days the scientific fame of the english friar roger bacon won him the reputation of a wizard in politics the friars of both orders played no unimportant part they in the thirteenth century were the free lances of the papal army preachers of crusades collectors of money for the pope's wars against the emperor diplomatic emissaries sellers of indulgences papal missionaries to distant lands they intervened in national affairs and acted as negotiators and peacemakers and as the confessors and advisers of kings and queens in the war between henry the third of england and his barons the franciscans were on the constitutional side while the dominicans tended to support the king with this growing secular activity and the vast extension of the mendicant orders went a corresponding spiritual deterioration the old ideal of poverty was forgotten as the friars became wealthy and self-indulgent disputes arose between the franciscans and the dominicans and dissension and schism within the franciscan order itself the spirituals or brethren of the strict observance under saint anthony of padua maintained the doctrine of st francis in its purity while the conventuals led by elias of cortona the general of the order relaxed the severity of the early rule the new mendicant orders of the carmelites or white friars and the austin friars were founded in an imitation of the original societies but by the end of the thirteenth century the religious revival which had produced such wonderful results had spent its force and the exalted mysticism of the first friars had degenerated into extravagance and superstition on the one hand the common people were agitated by outbursts of fanatical emotion on the other the strongholds of learning were shaken by intellectual sedition during the captivity of saint louis in egypt france and flanders were overrun by the pastoureaux or shepherds bands of peasants led by a zealot called the master of hungary who declared that they had a mission to rescue the king from the mohammedans and denounced the worldliness of clergy monks and friars later in the century was seen the still stranger phenomenon of the flagellants men women and children marching in penitential processions scourging one another as they went to the sound of doleful chants among the more educated classes fanaticism took the form of prophecy and allegorical interpretation of scripture even before the institution of the mendicant orders the calabrian abbot joachim of fiore had taught the doctrine of the eternal gospel whereby the world had to go through three stages corresponding to the persons of the trinity the age of the father had passed the age of the son was drawing to a close the age of the holy ghost was at hand when the poor and humble would be exalted and the tyrants would be cast down these visionary speculations were further elaborated in the middle of the thirteenth century by a franciscan friar in the introduction to the everlasting gospel the secular clerks of the university of paris at feud with the mendicants called attention to the dangerous character of the joachite opinions in this book and procured its condemnation the friars retaliated by attacking the perils of the last days a scathing criticism of the mendicant orders the work of william de saint amour the spokesman of the secular party louis the ninth supported them and the pope alexander the fourth always a friend to friars had william de saint amour tried before a roman tribunal though his writings were pronounced scandalous but not heretical he was suspended from teaching and banished from france End of section 24. Section 25 of the Central Period of the Middle Age, 918 to 1273, by Beatrice A. Lees. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 16 The Coming of the Friars and the Medieval Universities, Part 2. 
In this struggle between the regular and secular clergy, the University of Paris appears as a powerful, well-organized body. It had reached this position by a long process of gradual development and continuous effort. A medieval writer has described the three mysterious powers or virtues by whose harmonious cooperation the life and health of Christendom are sustained, sacerdotium or the papacy, imperium or the empire, and studium or the universities. These represent the three great forces of ecclesiasticism, imperialism, and scholasticism or learning, by which the visible church of God is built up. To the Italians belongs the papacy, to the Germans the empire, and to the French study or learning with its seat at Paris. The medieval university system was the direct outgrowth of the twelfth century Renaissance, which created a demand for tuition, and met that demand by a supply of teachers, and of the instinct of association which led students and teachers to organize themselves in groups for purposes of self-defense and the protection of professional interests. Such organization was first found at the two central points of the revival of learning, Bologna, the center for the study of law, and Paris, the theological center. At Bologna, the students, at Paris, the masters, formed what may be called scholastic guilds or trade unions, and the germ of the Paris University was this guild of masters. Crowds of students had been drawn to Paris in the twelfth century by the fame of Abelard's teaching. Their presence rendered necessary an increase of masters. The Chancellor of Notre Dame, to whom the superintendence of the cathedral schools was entrusted, began to grant formal permission to other masters to open schools. This licentia docendi, or license to teach, at first a matter of favor, became a matter of right, and could not be denied to a properly qualified applicant. Teachers multiplied rapidly, and their unwritten laws and professional customs crystallized into the statutes of an organized university. The birth of the University of Paris may be placed between 1150 and 1170, but the society had no written statutes till about 1209, and no head or presiding officer till much later. The university, in fact, grew into a legal, self-acting, self-governing corporation through the great struggle in which it entered in the 13th century with the Chancellor of Notre Dame, who claimed jurisdiction over the scholars as clerks. In this struggle, the Chancellor, backed by the bishop and chapter, would possibly have been victorious had not the papacy supported the university. As it was, the church party was defeated, and the Chancellor lost his judicial power. About the middle of the 13th century, the church made a second attempt to seize on the citadel of learning through the mendicant friars, and this time it succeeded, for the papacy threw its weight on the side of its faithful freelances, the friars, and St. Louis also sided with them. It is to this period that the incident of St. Amour's resistance and defeat belongs. The city of Paris supported the seculars, as is shown by the bitter satires on the mendicants of the Parisian Trouvert Routeboeuf. The triumph of the friars and their establishment as theological teachers within the university was doubtless furthered by the great fame of two of their number, the Dominicans, Albertus Magnus and St. Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas in particular holds a unique position in the history of medieval thought, for he effected a lasting reconciliation between philosophy and theology. By the beginning of the 13th century, almost all the works of Aristotle had found their way into the Western world. Some were directly translated from the Greek, others from Syriac or Arabic. Hence, a new intellectual element was introduced into the schools of the West, for the new Aristotle, the Bible of the schoolmen, came to Paris from Moorish Spain in an Oriental dress, and accompanied by the writings and commentaries of Arabic philosophers and men of science. The Orthodox authorities tried at first to prohibit the study of Aristotle altogether, but a more effectual remedy was supplied by the development of a system of Orthodox Aristotelianism, and this was supplied by the friars, the Franciscan Alexander of Hales, and the Dominicans, 
the German Albert the Great, and the Italian St. Thomas of Aquino. The University of Paris, when fully developed, was a sort of federation. It included four faculties, three superior faculties, theology, canon law, and medicine, each under a dean, and one inferior faculty, arts, divided into the four nations, French, Normans, Picard, and English, each under a proctor. At the head of all was a rector, who was elected by the Faculty of Arts. The University of Oxford and all the student universities were organized on much the same lines as Paris. Bologna was a master's university and formed a model for all other universities of the same kind. The course of medieval study was based, in the Faculty of Arts, on the seven liberal arts, the trivium, or threefold way, of grammar, rhetoric, and logic, and the quadrivium, or fourfold way, of music, arithmetic, geometry, and astronomy. Comparatively little was known of these last four subjects. The real heart and center of medieval education lay in the trivium, and more particularly in logic or dialectic, which, dull and dry as it may seem to modern minds, did at least train students in precision, accuracy, and the right rules of reasoning, and led them on to metaphysical speculations and philosophical disputations. The University of Bologna gradually developed out of the law school, which first rose into prominence with the revived interest in the Roman civil law, which was a marked feature of the twelfth-century Renaissance. The teaching of the great jurist Ernarius made Bologna famous, and Frederick Barbarossa patronized the Bolognese doctors of law and granted a privilege to the school. From Bologna, too, came the monk Gratian, who, in the middle of the twelfth century, drew up the Decretum, or Concordantia Discordantium Canonum, the most celebrated textbook of medieval canon law. The canon law became to the papacy what the civil law was to the empire. If the emperors based their claims to temporal supremacy on the imperial law of Rome, the popes supported the theory of the supremacy of the church, by the decrees and letters of their predecessors and the canons of ecclesiastical councils. Alexander III, Innocent III, Gregory IX, and Innocent IV were all trained canonists, and Gregory IX even added a new collection of papal decretals to the existing body of canon law. End of section 25. Section 26 of the Central Period of the Middle Age, 918 to 1273, by Beatrice A. Lees. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 17 Spain and Portugal, 918 to 1273. The history of Christian Spain has been described as one long crusade against the African Moors or Arabs who in the 8th century supplanted the ancient Visigothic kings and established an Omeyyad caliphate at Cordova. It would be equally true to speak of it as one long process of political consolidation, the gathering up of the many petty Iberian states into a strong united Spanish kingdom. It is a history of civil war and religious persecution, of intrigue and bloodshed, of battles and revolutions. Yet there is grandeur in the contrast between the Christian chivalry of the North and the splendid Mohammedan civilization of the South, and there is a special interest in the record of that struggle of races, creeds, and political systems which produced the Spain of the 16th century. In the early 10th century, the Iberian Peninsula was divided among the kingdoms of Leon and Navarre, the counties of Barcelona and Castile, and the Moorish Caliphate. These were the elements out of which the four kingdoms of Castile, Aragon, Leon, and Portugal were to be formed. The 10th century saw a succession of great rulers at Cordova, the Caliph Abd al-Rahman III, a beneficent despot and an enlightened ruler, his son Hakam II, a patron of learning and culture, and the able soldier Al-Mansur al-Allah, the victor of God, 
who reduced the young caliph Hishim II to a puppet, and in his name overran the kingdom of Leon and took its capital by storm, while the Christian princes wasted their strength in internal dissension. But the death of Almansor in 1002 was followed by the decline of the Mohammedan power. The caliphate became the prey of contending factions, until in 1031, on the death of the last caliph of the old line, it broke up into a number of small kingdoms or emirates. The disruption of the Mohammedan state left the field open to the Christians, and Navarre rose into prominence under Sancho the Great, 970 to 1035, who extended his rule over Castile, Aragon, and Leon. After his death in 1035, the supremacy passed to Castile, now a kingdom under Ferdinand I, 1033-1065, son of Sancho of Navarre. Ferdinand subdued Leon and handed on to his son, Alfonso VI, 1073-1109, the task of unification. In 1085, Alfonso took advantage of the weakness of the Mohammedans to conquer Toledo, the capital of the old Gothic kings, commanding the valley of the Tagus. His daughter married the king of the new state of Aragon, and the union of Spain seemed about to be effected, when the Moors called to their help the fanatical Almoravides from Africa, the fierce Berber tribes who had recently conquered Morocco. At the Battle of Zalaca in 1086, the Castilians were completely defeated. The army was almost wiped out, and Alfonso fled to Toledo with a mere handful of followers. To this period belongs the legend of the Spanish national hero, the Cid Campeador, or Lord Challenger, Roderick or Ruy Diaz de Bivar. In real history, he appears as a swashbuckler and soldier of fortune, fighting to eat, brave and capable, yet arrogant and avaricious, and willing to do battle in any cause for pay. He was banished from Castile, served with the Mohammedans against the Christians, and finally in 1094 conquered Valencia from the Moors, and ruled there as a practically independent sovereign until his death in 1099. Such was the man who became the center of a cycle of heroic and romantic legends, and has been glorified as the champion of Spanish Christianity and the model of a chivalrous knight. At the close of the 11th century, the Almoravides, under their great leader Yusef, subdued the degenerate Spanish Mohammedans and made Moorish Spain a province of the Empire of Morocco. The only son of Alfonso VI fell fighting against the invaders, and when Alfonso himself died in 1109, Aragon became the predominant Christian power under the warlike Alfonso I, the fighter, 1104 to 1134. Throughout the 12th century, the war of Christians and Moors in Spain bore the character of a regular crusade. The empire of the Almoravides was threatened by the rise of a new sect of stern Berber reformers, the Almohades, and its embarrassment gave an opportunity to the Christians, which they eagerly seized. Crusaders from France, England, and Italy, Templars and Hospitallers, flocked to the help of the king of Aragon, and when Alfonso the fighter was killed in 1134, the struggle was continued under the king of Castile, Alfonso the Seventh, 1126 to 1157. In 1147, a fleet of English, German, and Flemish crusaders saved Lisbon for the king of Portugal, and later in the century, the Spanish military orders of Calatrava, Alcantara, and Santiago, with the Portuguese order of Evora, were founded in imitation of the Templars and Hospitallers to carry on the Holy War. So great was the power of Alfonso VII that he formally assumed the title of Emperor, but the supremacy of Castile ended with his death and the death of his son, and the succession of the child king Alfonso VIII from 1158 to 1214. In the west, the great victory over the Moors at Uric in 1139 had enabled Alfonso of Portugal to transform his country into a hereditary monarchy. Aragon broke away from Castile and formed a close union with Catalonia, and even Leon was separated from Castile on the death of Alfonso VII. 
dynastic quarrels and civil war weakened the christian states while the Almohades, who had supplanted the Almoravides in Morocco, established a strong Moorish government in southern Spain, and in 1195 inflicted a severe defeat on the Castilians at Alarcos. Seventeen years later, in 1212, the Christians took their revenge when, in the decisive battle of Las Navas de Tolosa, the allied forces of castile aragon and navarre strengthened by a large contingent of foreign crusaders and by the military orders crushed the power of the moors destroyed the prestige of the almohades and ended forever the moorish domination in spain the history of spain in the thirteenth century may be grouped around the figures of three great kings james i of aragon and ferdinand i and Alfonso X of Castile. James I, the Conqueror, 1213-1276, the son of the King of Aragon who fell in the Battle of Muret, was a fine soldier who extended the boundaries of Aragon and subdued Valencia and the Balearic Islands, a legislator and an administrator. He prepared the way for the future connection between Aragon and Sicily, by the marriage of his son to the daughter of Manfred of Hohenstaufen. He was a patron of commerce and a man of letters, who wrote a history of his own conquests in the Catalan tongue. Yet the aristocracy of Aragon was too strong for him to set up a highly centralized monarchy, and he had to submit to constitutional checks on his power. These were imposed by the Justicia, or supreme judge, who was appointed to arbitrate between the king and his subjects, and to protect the national liberties by the Cortes, or States General, in which the towns were represented, and by the leagues, Hermandades, of the towns among themselves. Ferdinand I, the Saint, 1214 to 1252, who inherited Leon from his father and Castile from his mother, conquered Cordova and extended the Christian rule over the whole of Spain with the exception of the little kingdom of Granada. He consolidated Leon and Castile and began that revision of the existing law which led under Alfonso X to the issue of one of the most famous legal codes in the world, the Siete Partidas, or Seven Parts. Alfonso X, the Wise, 1252 to 1284, the son of St. Ferdinand, the rival of Richard of Cornwall in the contest for the imperial crown, was remarkable even in an age of great rulers. Learned and scientific, an astronomer and a philosopher, he encouraged men of parts and ability without distinction of creed or race. Though the Castilians had more respect for royalty and were less independent than the Aragonese and Catalans, here, as in Aragon, the king found himself compelled to summon the Cortes, to consult the nobles, and to grant privileges to the towns. By 1273 the Reconquista, or Reconquest of Spain, was at an end, but the long war against the infidel had created a new Spain, orthodox, aristocratic, and ambitious, and while Navarre turned more and more toward France, Castile, Aragon, and Portugal threw themselves as independent powers into the vortex of international politics. End of section 26《Section 27 of the Central Period of the Middle Age, 918 to 1273, by Beatrice A. Lees. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 18 The Fall of the Hohenstaufen and the Great Interregnum, 1250 to 1273. A prophecy was current in the 13th century that the empire would end with Frederick II. It was a truer saying than the men who repeated it knew. The dreams of Otto III, the ambitions of Frederick Barbarossa, the splendid visions of Henry VI, were all buried in the grave of the wonder of the world. When, after twenty-three years of anarchy, the empire was reconstituted under the Habsburg dynasty, its great days were over, its commanding position was lost, and there only remained to it a future of lingering and ignoble decay. 
The history of the final fall of the Hohenstaufen is soon told. Pope Innocent IV had vowed never to make peace with Frederick II and his viper brood, and he kept his word. Though when he came down in triumph into Italy after Frederick's death, he found himself almost a prisoner in Rome, under the domination of the powerful senator Brancaleone, he never ceased to plot against the Hohenstaufen. He offered the crown of Sicily in succession to Charles of Anjou, the brother of Louis IX of France, to Richard of Cornwall, the brother of Henry III of England, and to Edmund of Lancaster, the younger son of Henry III, a boy of eight years old. Frederick II had bequeathed the imperial and Sicilian crowns to his eldest legitimate son, Conrad IV, 1250 to 1254, and had appointed his illegitimate son, Manfred, Prince of Tarentum, viceroy of the kingdom of sicily in conrad's absence in twelve fifty one conrad the fourth entered italy and made himself master of apulia he was planning an advance on lombardy when in may of twelve fifty four a sudden fever cut him off in the flower of his youth his half-brother henry had died in the previous year and only the little conradine conrad's two-year-old son was left to carry on the legitimate line of the Hohenstaufen dynasty. Still the cause of the Ghibellines was not hopeless while Manfred of Tarentum remained. Brave, accomplished, and talented, he resembled his father in person and in character and seemed born to be a king. The death of Innocent IV in the winter of 1254 and the accession of the more peaceable Alexander IV further raised the hopes of the imperialists, while in 1256 the anti-Caesar, William of Holland, was killed, and the great interregnum, 1256 to 1273, began in Germany. In Italy, Manfred ignored the claims of his little nephew and ruled the Sicilian kingdom as an independent sovereign, bidding defiance to the papal excommunication which was hurled against him. He found partisans in central and northern Italy, and the Ghibelline victory of Monte Aperto in 1260 gave the important city of Florence to the imperialists, while the Ghibellines of Rome proclaimed Manfred senator in opposition to Richard of Cornwall, the Guelph candidate. Even the fall of Frederick II's son-in-law, the cruel tyrant of Verona, Ezzelino da Romano, who died, defeated by the Guelphs, in 1259, rather strengthened Manfred's position by freeing him from a dangerous ally and possible rival. In 1261, however, Alexander IV was succeeded by Urban IV, a Frenchman, who called his countrymen to his aid and offered the crown of Sicily to Charles of Anjou, the brother of the King of France. The Guelph party in Rome chose Charles Senator, a crusade was preached against Manfred and his Saracen troops, and though Urban IV died in 1264, his successor Clement IV continued his policy. In 1265, Charles of Anjou entered Rome. In 1266, he was crowned King of Sicily and St. Peter's, and a few weeks later he completely defeated the Sicilian army on the plains of Grandella near Benevento. Where are my Ghibellines, cried Manfred, when he saw the splendid Tuscan cavalry arrayed against his Germans and Saracens. When he realized that the day was lost, he rushed into the thickest of the fight and fell on the field of battle. Crushed under the yoke of the stern Charles of Anjou, the Sicilians bitterly deplored the young king whom in life they had not appreciated, and they in the Ghibelline cities of Tuscany and Lombardy sent envoys to Germany to rouse the half-fledged eaglet, Conradine, now a high-spirited boy of fourteen. Fired with the hope of winning back the heritage of his fathers, Conradine led an army over the Brenner Pass into Italy, and entered Pavia, the old Ghibelline capital, early in 1268. The Pope denounced the poisonous little king, Regulus, of the viper brood, and thundered excommunications against his followers, but Pisa gave him a fleet, Siena supported him, and Rome received him with acclamation. Clement IV looked on unmoved. This expedition will pass like smoke, he said. Let the lamb be led to the slaughter. 
the end was indeed at hand. Conradine advanced from Rome upon Apulia at Talia Cozzo on the borders of the southern kingdom. Charles of Anjou gave him battle and inflicted a terrible defeat upon the Ghibelline forces. Conradine, flying from the field, was taken prisoner and after a short captivity was beheaded at Naples on October 29, 1268. Italian and Provencal poets sang of the piteous death of the young Corradino, while Germany mourned for the last of the Hohenstaufen. A month later, Clement IV died, and the papacy remained vacant for more than two years. In the south, Charles of Anjou, elected senator of Rome for life and ruthless in his victory, governed the hapless Sicilians in so tyrannical and despotic a fashion that it ultimately lost him the kingdom. Northern Italy, meanwhile, fell back into civil war, and the strife of city against city, of Guelph against Ghibelline, raged more fiercely than ever, so that Dante, the great Italian poet of the fourteenth century, could only compare his country to a ship without a pilot drifting in the storm. Nor was Germany in much better case. The death of William of Holland in 1256 was followed by a double imperial election, of the seven great magnates lay and ecclesiastical who now alone acted as electors four chose the papal candidate richard of cornwall and three voted for alfonso the tenth of castile alfonso never set foot in germany richard was crowned at aachen but he did not receive the imperial crown at rome and in twelve seventy two he died after playing a somewhat ignominious part in the war in england between henry the third and his barons germany was now a prey to all the horrors of feudal anarchy the princes the lesser nobles and the prelates fought and struggled for wealth and power and the people were helpless before them the one gleam of hope was to be found in the cities which united in defensive leagues grew strong free and independent amidst the general confusion at length pope gregory x the successor of clement the fourth threatened that if the electors did not end the interregnum he would choose an emperor on his own responsibility this moved them to action and in twelve seventy three they met at frankfurt and elected count rudolf of Habsburg, the founder of the great austrian dynasty with his accession began a new era in the history of the empire end of section twenty seven Section 28 of the Central Period of the Middle Age, 918 to 1273, by Beatrice A. Lees. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Conclusion Europe at the End of the Thirteenth Century. The three centuries and a half which lay between 919 and 1273 saw many changes in Western Europe the attempt to realize the imperial idea of a world state and the attempt to establish a kingdom of god upon earth in a world church had alike failed and the great popes and emperors had given place to lesser men the monastic orders had lost their early fervor the religious enthusiasm which had inspired the first crusade had been diverted to worldly ends the feudal bonds of vassalage and land tenure were weakening all the most distinctively medieval institutions were in the process of transformation yet the middle ages were the link between the ancient and the modern world the dark rich soil into which fell the ripe fruits of classic antiquity there to quicken into new forms of life under the shadow of empire and papacy the nation-states of europe were developing france in nine nineteen a loose federation of provinces with a shadowy claim to an imperial mission was by twelve seventy three a strong centralized monarchy with a splendid future before it england had entered into the company of western nations as one of the great continental powers spain italy germany were each in its own way working out their national destinies and finding expression for a growing national feeling in vernacular language and patriotic literature in the far north denmark norway and sweden had become christian kingdoms 
on the eastern frontier of germany the slav monarchies of bohemia and poland and the magyar sovereigns of hungary were interposed between the advancing tide of teutonic colonization and the vast incalculable forces of russia and the near east bohemia in particular under its iron king odokar the second absorbed austria sturia carinthia and carniola and extended its frontier to the adriatic meanwhile the eastern empire was slowly tottering to its fall and the latin kingdom of jerusalem was a scene of anarchy templars and hospitallers genoese and pisans wrangled and fought and disputed over their rights while after the death of conradin the last direct descendant of yolande the lusignan of cyprus claimed the crown the turks would doubtless have brought the feeble kingdom to a speedy end had not the invasion of the tartars occupied their whole attention in the early thirteenth century the tartars or mongols a race akin to the turks had built up a great empire in china and persia under the inflexible emperor genghis khan and his successors in twelve twenty four the tartars invaded europe and defeated the russians all through the first half of the thirteenth century they were the scourge and terror of eastern christendom the days of the magyar raids seemed to have returned bulgaria and russia poland and hungary were devastated the settlement of the golden horde in the valley of the volga was effected and for several centuries russia bowed beneath the mongol yoke in twelve fifty eight the tartars took baghdad and the orthodox caliphate came to an end in twelve fifty nine they invaded syria and captured aleppo and damascus the pope and louis the ninth of france hoping to find a new ally against the turks entered into negotiations with them but in twelve sixty the sultan kutiz won a great victory over them at ain talut a battle which sealed the fate of the latin kingdom of jerusalem when a few weeks later the sultan was murdered by his mamelukes their leader bibars ben doktar the panther became ruler of egypt and began the deliberate piecemeal conquest of the christian states of syria which ended with the fall of acre in 1291 the last outposts of latin christianity in the far east were thus lost and the last checks on the power of the turks were removed the extinction of the typically medieval feudal kingdom of jerusalem is a fit close for the history of the central period of the middle ages end of section 28 Recording by Pamela Nagami in Encino, California, April 2018. End of the Central Period of the Middle Age, 918 to 1273 by Beatrice A. Lees.